Welcome to Under One Sky Conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to see everyone here with us today. I hope you are excited as much as I am. Uh, this is regional session two for Europe, Middle East, Africa, and India. Uh, I'll be the host of the session. My name is Miriam al qassab I am an IDA dedicated dark sky advocate from Bahrain. Also, I am the uh, president of Bahrain Stargazers Astronomy Club. Uh, today we have lovely three speakers who will share the stories and uh, expertise with us. Uh, but before I start the session, I would like to remind you that we have a available translated captions. You can find them there, down there on the um, toolbar. Uh, and the chat is on. You can talk with each other, introduce yourself. Maybe you can tell us where are you from. That would be great to know. And uh, the Q&A feature also there on the toolbar. Please leave your comment, your questions there. We will uh, read your questions at the end of the session. Uh, before uh, I start the session, I would like to remind you that we are uh, welcoming our respectful community and we accept uh, the same thing from your end. Uh, let's keep this session clean and respectful. Uh, let me, without any further ado, let me introduce our first um, uh, speaker uh, uh, from Nepal, Biraj, Biraj Nani Basti. All right. He is uh, currently a high school senior. Uh, his love for astronomy and stargazing steamed when he stargazed, when he went for stargazing session with his relative during his childhood in Nepal. Uh, however, he noticed that he couldn't see the same constellations and dark sky that he could see in Nepal in the United States. After researching the topic and learning about IDA, he has been working hard on addressing light pollution. Uh, Viraj's uh, topic will be involving you or uh, involving our youth in fighting for dark sky. Welcome, Viraj. Uh, hi, thank you. Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. good <laughs> yep. All right. 20 minutes, right? Yes. All right. So uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone in this conference right now from all over the world. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank IDA and the amazing people behind the 2022 Under One Sky Conference that worked incredibly hard to make this event happen in the first place. Uh, additionally, I'm also very thankful for getting this opportunity to give a presentation alongside other amazing people that share the same goal as we all do in making our night skies darker once again. Uh, for my presentation, what we'll be focusing on is involving our youth in fighting for darker night skies. All right, so starting off, uh, we have set up a poll here asking at what age did everyone here get interested into stargazing or astronomy? Uh, let's take about a minute or so to get all the results in. All right, so uh, looking at the data here coming in, we can see a sort of distribution here that's mostly right skewed um, with a lot of people getting introduced into stargazing when they were from the six to 12 years old and also here in the left with zero to six and from 12 to 20. And this is quite frankly true because most of us as little kids, we see a night sky as like vast openness and we are inclined to be interested in exploring it. And people tend to discover their passion for stargazing and astronomy when they're in their childhood, or in some cases here, also in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, and even above 50s. Uh, quite an incredible community here, we have to say the least. 
All right, so moving forward, uh, anyone have certain events that led to the spark of interest? I would just like to understand if like anyone had like gone to a certain event or a notable first date a celebration that got everyone here interested in stargazing. Uh, as we can't have a poll for type out answers, we can just go ahead and type in a chat and look into some cases if anyone wants. And for me, it was going, as uh, Miriam said, it was going stargazing with my relatives in Nepal. And it was like a weekly tradition thing we had. And going there over and over again, I slowly developed my own interest. And that's how I got started with the whole idea of stargazing. All right, that's fine. Moving we'll on. Boy Scout, yeah. Uh, I have a lot of friends here that are like Boy Scout, Girl Scout, and they have a lot of stuff dealing with uh, astronomy and stargazing. So that is one common idea that we had. Um, viewing Haley's comment with my dad, uh, that's really interesting. Mm. All right, so moving forward. So here what we have is a study that looks at the age of initial interest in stargazing. Uh, in this slide here, this study is from How Astronomers View Education and Public Outreach, an explanatory study by Lisa Dang and Pedro Russo. Looking at this graph, we can see that even during our childhood, the primary time frame where our interest for stargazing starts to develop is during the years four to nine for us. So now we must ask why? Why is it that we're so interested in this grand display in the night sky at our youngest ages? And the answer lies in the fact that kids are very, very, very curious. This shouldn't surprise anyone. Since ever since we're born, we have the natural tendency to cause as much chaos and mayhem we can around the house, fidgeting, poking, and prodding everything in our sight. And based off, this, based off what the study listed, there are three things that are really critical when understanding why young children are so keen to their surroundings. First and foremost, during the developmental stages of childhood, kids are developing their brain tissues. During this, during this interval, kids really feed off their curiosity and their innate desire to explore the things around them. Secondly, in order to further stimulate learning and curiosity in kids, we as educators, parents, and even mentors need to help engage youth and youth students in activities that truly helps them perceive a situation and discover the patterns in those situations to explain the causes behind it. Um, lastly, going along with the previously mentioned ideas, our critical thinking abilities start to mature and develop in our early youth. Therefore, it is clear to see why little kids might be the ones that are most interested in trying to ponder what's out there in the vast of the sky at night. So before moving forward, just a little bit more about me. Uh, I am Barrage, and I'm currently a high school senior student at Westbrook High School here in Beaumont, Texas. However, I was raised in Nepal. And this is where I initially took off for stargazing and astronomy when I was around eight years old, uh, the age where wonders just devoured me. Uh, my parents always told me that if I wasn't eating or watching something, I was definitely breaking or splattering something around the house. Back then, living in a somewhat ruler part of Nepal where light pollution level was quite low, we didn't have uh, that many lampposts. It was just like inside that house lighting and not so much like outside. Uh, you could see the whole night sky as for what it was, uh, straight out looking outside your backyard or anything. However, going back 10 years later, eight years later, things have changed a lot. The culprit, poor lighting practices and lack of policies to address them. And this is quite frankly due to light pollution. However, one thing we need to understand about light pollution is that it doesn't affect our discovery of the night sky at night. We have already seen the night sky for the beauty it is at some point during our life. Therefore, we're still trying to find the same joy in seeing it for what it was first time we saw it and the beauty it was. So that's our main idea and reason behind why we're working towards making darker night skies. However, the youth of our generation far and wide, this notion is becoming far less common. For instance, we can look at my case in Nepal, a place that once had an insignificant light pollution problem not even two decades ago now has become a hotspot for the rapid rise in light pollution that results in a decreased interest for the spectacles in the night sky. This truly ties into the code here from researcher Christopher Koba. Light is growing rap most rapidly in places that didn't have a lot of light to start with, in my case, Nepal. Th that means that the fastest rates of increase are occurring in places that so far hadn't very strongly affected by hadn't been strongly affected by light pollution. So with all this in mind, we need to ask one question. How can our future generation begin to want darker night skies if they have never experienced the full beauty that is our true night sky with all the constellations and the wonders and the spectacles in the sky? So this is where I started to do, do my work. Uh, how my work in Nepal and the USA with involving our youth. So if we're not interested in something, we'll, we'll not be inclined to work towards a change for that matter. Therefore, in order to get started with making changes, I had to get people interested, especially little kids in the night dark sky. 
So what we did was we promoted astronomy clubs in primary schools in Nepal for students the ages eight to 12. Um, before moving forward, I would like to ask if anyone here has experience using apps like SkyMap, Starwalk, uh, Sky Safari, or other ones off our Apple or Google Play Store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some interest in them. Yeah, Solarium's a really good one. I'll use that as well. Nice. All right. So these apps, though not exactly what we all may want, are really effective at developing interests, especially among young students who are able to like, see on their phones or their iPads or tablets what's going on in the night sky above them. And in schools like Bhagwani School, what we did was create small group astronomy clubs, specifically utilizing apps like that SkyMap Sky and Starwalk. And occasionally on some computers, we had the teachers install Solarium. Uh, we were able to show kids certain constellations and pique their interest a little bit. Uh, this was all it took. Now we had them wanting to see the spectacles in the night sky with their own eyes in the sky above. This is where we had to introduce, introduce them to the problem at hand, which was light pollution. However, there is one problem regarding explaining light pollution. Explaining light pollution for me has been from much more from a research standpoint, where I looked at numbers, crunches, and like data, and a whole bunch of other like math stuff, which is not something that a lot of kids enjoy. Uh, while this fascinates researchers and number fanatics like myself, the kids, they're not inclined to learn about light pollution from that point of view. Uh, they are not great at crunching numbers, and it's something that's developed through education and practice over time. However, kids are really good at one thing. Like I, like I previously mentioned, they're really good at poking, prodding, and just figuring stuff out by experiencing them. And this is where we utilize demos. Um, so what we did was we sought to help them visualize light pollution using demos like the one here above uh, from DePaul's University's paper plate education project. Uh, fun fact, the pictures here are actually from a child as well, an eight-year-old to be exact. Now here, before moving forward, I would like to ask if anyone else in the chat has been familiar with demos like these or introduce kids to these demos and stuff like that. Any specific place where this happened, like uh, nature centers or parks, or uh, that's a picture of Chicago, yes. Light pollution simulator box. Connie Walker has used a demo like this that I've used, yep. Um, all right, so what this demo consisted of was, what we had was, uh, uh, I think a 12 by 12 by 12 inch, a foot by foot, a foot, 12 by 12 by 12 box. We painted it black and on the inside, like what we have here, we put the background off the place we were around, or in some cases we just had like local cities. And then we had the flashlight as demonstrated put inside. And then our figurine was in a person because we didn't have that. But what we used was little dinosaurs and little uh, turtles and stuff like that to represent the figurine that's under the lamppost. And then from here, kids are truly engaged because now they have a 12 by 12 by 12 box that they can touch, probe, and have fun with to understand what's going on. So uh, let's talk about why these demos are so good for kids once again. Kids can visualize really well, a truly critical concept for them. As previously mentioned, to critically think about the subject matter for kids and create pattern, they need to create patterns and ideas in their brain to uh, fully understand and comprehend the situation. When they see the lighting differences, the oohs and ahs that radiate the environment, truly so that they understand the concept. So moving back into how we utilize the model, what we did was we started off with like just a blank model with without the figuring there and with the flashlight on with the uh, without the hood on. That way they were not able to see the figurine at hand. They were just seeing the city and they're like, this might be like a experiment showing how you can see the city with a light. However, when we put the hood on and then they see the figure in the bottom, then their minds start to turn. It's like, what happened? Like, I didn't see that before. And that's where we're able to slowly engage them into understanding what light pollution is and how it's an issue that affects what's directly under us. 
because when the light from the lamppost are going outside the sky above, uh, it just radiates the whole entire environment. It goes to the city, goes to our clouds, and just leads to further light pollution. However, by using hooded infrastructure and hooded lampposts, we're able to get what they want to see, the figurine, shown. And this is how we work towards getting kids to understanding what light pollution was. Uh, in this next picture, we have a picture of what I was working on. I don't think the box is being able to be shown here. It's behind the little black duffel box. But we had the box there, and we had kids looking in. And overall, it was a really good event. And just the idea of the kids being able to see it in person and look at it and visualize it and just see the different changes as we put the hood on without the hood on, it's truly uh, an incredible like thing for the kids. And that's, I think, our biggest aim and goal at helping kids understand what light pollution is and working and becoming future dark sky workers or future people who want to make our dark, night skies darker again. So now that we got the kids both interested and understanding of what light pollution is, how can we get them involved in pushing for darker night skies? So what we did was we could we stopped them we could get started on helping them with making a sunlight petition system with like little notes that we could send to city officials, uh, sending these small notes to government officials, mostly city officials in like the local cities. Uh, we were involving the kids in something that they could carry on doing for the rest of their lives, making changes to pushing for better policies. Uh, before moving forward, I'd like to ask if anyone here has previous experience working with policymakers or mm, filmmakers in your local cities or even like neighborhood consultants uh, with trying to get better lighting practices going on. I'll read through a couple of the answers here. The big advantage of a box is that you can show the unaffected sky also in urban areas and get the kid and, and get the wonder to the kids. Yeah, that's the whole that's that's a really good point of it. And it's truly amazing to how like kids can really understand the idea with the box. And I think that's like their biggest goal moving forward is like getting these demos out to kids so that they can like fully understand what's going on. Mm waiting on responses for the policy if anyone has previous experience on this yes it's tough to get started but then it gets easier as time goes on uh we're still on like the starting phase so that's why like, our agenda is really quite slow in nepal but moving forward uh no matter how slow the policy agenda might be kids were the agent of action here and that's the most important part their efforts we're contributing to raising awareness and hopefully changing the futures in their communities. Uh, I personally did follow through with some of these petitions and what I did was I had my own presentation for them and I introduced some lighting policy ordinances that have worked in places previously and have been, have been successful. And I also showed that to the city officials. And in Nepal, there's a lot of conflicts going on, a lot of other issues with like policy that doesn't really make room or space for this right now but i think with gradual effort and just being persistent persistent in our effort of like making sure that they look at agenda and like we have work here and we need to make a change here hopefully something can happen in the future and like i've said the kids are the agents of action here their petitions and when they grow up their voice is going to be the main thing and helping make sure this issue gets addressed so to recap um first things first we had to get the kids interested in astronomy and the night sky we love and utilizing our astronomy club and demos, we were able to do this to kids. Uh, actually, and then secondly, figuring out how to enter that system to the concept of light pollution. This is where the 12 by 12 by 12 box demo happens, and they're able to see fully what's hindering their ability to see the night sky. And the cause of that being light pollution, they're sort of like they start to develop the idea of that with the 12 by 12 by 12 box. And then the third step is taking uh, actions through either petitions or even outreach. And petitions were used initially for little kids, and outreach was something I did. But now, as the kids grow older, what we're planning on doing with them is hopefully having them also go to city officials and talk on a regular basis so that the agenda gets highlighted a bit more deeply and more people in the city and the officials in the government are inclined to make these changes. So, now let's look at a little bit of a post involvement in Nepal. So at schools, astronomy clubs are still very strong. Uh, as we've had new kids coming to the schools, uh, older students who I was able to taught, teach are now teaching the new students about the astronomy and stargazing, uh, sky safari, sky map, and all those apps are still being used. And the demos that like the box that we sent them are still being utilized to show the fact of light pollution. And then at the policy level, uh, like I've said previously, the agenda is moving quite slowly, but we're gradually making progress towards passing lighting policy infrastructure ordinances in certain Nepali communities. 
And in some cases, what we have is kids in their local neighborhoods. Uh, what they're doing is they have these lampposts now that because of improved like urbanizing of Nepal cities, they have a uh, lamppost there and they're not hooded. So some kids seeing what they've learned, uh, they've asked their parents to go hood it. And that's truly incredible to see from my standpoint that it shows kids are taking their own stance and they're making their own ideas and working towards making sure that light pollution is not an issue moving forward in the future. And hopefully there will be successful in a job and overtake us and get, uh, get good work done in the future. And with that, these are the citations that I've used in my presentations. And thank you for my time. And once again, I'd like to thank IDA and everyone involved for this opportunity to present here at the Under One Sky 2022 conference. Uh, thank you. And with the amount of time left, uh, I should be open to any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you, Viraj, for the beautiful uh, presentation. Um, yeah, you're doing a wonderful job. Uh, and I believe uh, so many from our participants here, um, they can relate to your um, what you are feeling and and how you are and what you are going through. Uh, we will take the questions uh, at the end of the session. Remember, if you have any question for Biraj, uh, leave uh, the question in the uh, Q and A uh, feature. Uh, also, we have, um, I just forgot to uh, remind everyone that we have so many participants from all over the world. From We have from Switzerland, Germany, uh, Dubai, uh, Case A, uh, which is Saudi, Bahrain, myself, and the club of our members that are here, members of our club that are here with us today. Uh, thank you once again, Biraj, for the wonderful um, presentation. And now we can go to our second speak uh, speaker, uh, Patricia Lopez Yanis. Uh, Patricia was born in Ecuador uh, and currently lives in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. She holds graduate degree in architecture from Ecuador and master degrees in architecture lighting design from Germany. Has com she has completed postgraduate studies, becoming a Harvard Business School alumni in 2022. She has practiced lighting design in Europe and Middle East for over 17 years. That wonderful. <laughs> she now holds the position of uh, lighting design director at the PIFs, the Red Sea Development Company, and Amala in KSA. Welcome, Patricia Lopez. Thank you very much, Miriam, for the wonderful introduction. Let me share my screen now. One moment, please. I cannot find my presentation. Let's see. Okay. Okay, I might, I had some pictures to show, but apparently I'm not able to share. Let me, ah, okay, I found it, got it. Okay, there you go, perfect. Thank you, Patricia, I have 20 minutes. Yes, great. <laughs> Thank you very much again. And well, first of all, hi, everybody. And uh, today I will speak to you about how our Dark Sky Initiative has become a source for design creativity. First of all, I'd like to start by thanking the International Dark Sky Association and the team that organized this wonderful event for letting me share my experience. It is truly an honor to be speaking among this talented group of people, as we've just heard, who are sharing their experiences from different points of view about dark sky and who are um, who have so different ideas and I think this is what makes the event quite unique as a designer for example I'm used to hearing about dark sky from other designers but it's very very unique to hear from let's say from the perspective of of other points of view as we just heard from the youth and education and now from the environment 
And first of all, I am speaking to you from the Middle East. Uh, I'm currently living in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where I arrived almost two years ago after having lived in Dubai for 12 years. And as you might maybe imagine, I would have never imagined to live in a country that I thought of as so mysterious. Uh, but once I arrived to Saudi, I was pleasantly surprised by the warmth, uh, the pride and the poise of all the Saudis who have really made myself and many expert colleagues feel very welcome uh, to this developing and very, very curious and open country. So let me start by telling you my, my story of my first days in Riyadh. So in my first weekend in Riyadh, a very good friend of mine who I met in, in, in school, she invited me through a, to a family gathering to a beautiful setting that's called the edge of the world. At the edge of the world, which is like, I would say maybe an hour or so from away from Riyadh, you can find these beautiful cliffs. And once I arrived there, I was stunned by the nature of Saudi who, I think that many of us, when we think of Saudi, we rarely think about these settings. But uh, when I was there with all her family and kids, we went, we climbed off the cliffs, we went into caves, uh, we, um, we, we hiked all over the place. And at the end, almost when there was sunset, we had um, um, a dinner uh, of a very typical uh, dish called makluba. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. And it was uh, a dish made of rice and lamb. And it was in the desert with all the tents. And then at the end, we could uh, actually see the stars. And of course, you could see the sky glow from Riyadh, but you could see the stars. And that's when it all started connecting for me. It was the first time that I, that I saw actually the stars in Riyadh. So this marked the beginning of my life in Saudi. And from that point on, I have been constantly amazed by the nature. So I think that's the undisco undiscovered part of Saudi because for example, when you go to Jazan, you can see uh, this beautiful sea. When you go to Yambu, you can see these amazing mountains. You can see volcanoes. And of course, when you go to the Red Sea and Amala, you can see these islands with beautiful nature, with turtles, with bats, with birds and um, it's something that we can that we can really it's hard to imagine when you when you think of of of, uh, of a country like this but i think i was thinking like why why am i so amazed about this beauty and it is i think that because of living in big cities so i've been living in big cities like in dubai some cities of the states in ecuador itself and the thing is in big cities is that you just um stop seeing the stars and then um that's when, for example, when, when you go to remote locations, for example, right now I'm, I'm basically based between the capital and site, you start really valuing nature and really thinking of what we can do to protect the nature. So uh, just to give you a, a little bit of a background uh, about my role in my company and why am I here. So my role in my company that's called now the Red Sea Global is to lead all of our hospitality, landscape and master planning developments uh, from the lighting perspective. So our team is multidisciplinary. We are um, different um, specialists from architecture, interior design, um, environment. And what we do is we oversee all of these huge developments from the clients or from the PIF's point of view. But what really amazed me is that from the beginning, from my first interview and first chats that I had with the Red Sea, the subject of dark sky came up. Uh, so this is a concept that was embedded in the master plan since the conception, since the very conception of, this, of these master plans. And every time that I talk to my executive team, I keep on hearing the idea that it began with a turtle and it will end with a turtle, which seemed like a very nice phrase for me, but the more I get into it, the more, the more I realize what it actually means and how does it relate to a dark sky. So um, we have what we call a dark sky initiative, which has been one of the main drivers of this development and has been established by the boards, which is in line with our core environmental values. So at Red Sea Global, we really take care of the environment. We are, we are building very huge developments like hotels, like new cities, but we are doing it all around the care for the environment, which is not usual. We could, we might as well just choose to uh, build towards a commercial development or a urban development, but it was a decision of the creators to make uh, these developments evolve around the care for nature. 
So this doesn't come without challenges. So imagine if you are maybe just a scientist or a, an astronomer and you're focused on your beautiful field, um, you have challenges. I have felt the challenges myself because there are many uh, expectations, let's say from the operators, from the hospitality uh, team uh, that make us, make us question the dark side principles all the time. And what we are doing now is balancing their expectations with uh, the expectations that the board, that our executives have with those of our, of our wildlife. How can we create these amazing destinations, but at the same time, make sure that we protect the wildlife. And this can only be done with a strategic approach. So as soon as I joined the company, I think one of my first meetings was with IDA and we started putting the pieces together. Okay, we need to create these beautiful destinations, but we also need to work hand in hand with associations such as the IDA. So uh, some, some, some people that I really need to uh, recognize are our group of international lighting designers. Some of them are, I think, listening and, um, I think that without them, we really couldn't couldn't have the team that we have because each hotel, each development that we're developing have a lighting designer. And this lighting designer has to adhere to the principles of dark sky, which if you're like me and you've been designing for so many years with conventional lighting design approach, it's not very easy to rethink all of the things that you have learned for years. So um, something that's very, very good is that we've seen uh, truly unconventional lighting concepts. It's not your typical uplights and flood washing and media facades. We're really seeing like really unique, creative uh, approaches to lighting. And this is something that I'd like to share with you. So I'd like to share with you my lessons learned in respect to the environment. Um, I'd like to share with you the, the lessons learned from the setting the new standards um, in the field of lighting. So something that I like about lighting is that it's a mixture within, between the aesthetics and also the technical. So even though you can create a beautiful setting, you always need to measure, measure your design by, by technical, uh, technical guidelines. And most of all, uh, as I always speak to creators, to designers, to artists, uh, what has Dark Sky done for the creative? So, uh, in regards to the, the respect for the environment, I'd like to talk about the dialogue between lighting designers like me and dark skies. So, before coming to Saudi, I had a great experience at a, as a lighting designer in projects where the approach was very urban and commercial. So, I used to work in Dubai, and my goal my company's goal was to create these wonderful destinations. As we all know, Dubai is the city of lights, it's the city of the bigger, the better. Um, but uh, once we were, um, once we, once I was, I was in Dubai, I was constantly being asked, okay, how can I make this, this tower the brightest one in the block? How can I make this, uh, the, this media facade the most amazing one? So it, as soon as I arrived to the Middle East, that was my job, making these stunning, designing these stunning towers, making them brighter, making them the most attractive in the block. So that was actually the first steps that I had here in the Middle East, which is, I think, uh, instead of criticizing, I would like to take a step back and acknowledge, I think that there is room for having a, a, a media facade that's on. It's, it's about more educating the people and telling them, okay, if you leave the media facade on all night, every night, it will just become part of the background. But we need to educate the people and tell them, okay, uh, we can have this media facade, we can, we can have this tower that's beautifully lit, but we need to time it, we need to perhaps use a different color, we need to dim it down. So uh, those are the thoughts that I've thought that I've had after working, for example, in big cities like in Dubai. Now, at the Red Sea in Amala, on the other hand, my challenge has been to uh, to question myself and to tell that my team of lighting designers what we can do uh, with every single light source that we choose, how to choose the every single light source in such a mindful way with such conscious that it has the right shielding, the right color temperature, the location and the quantity, even before it's considered. So what we've discovered is that if every light source is not selected or very carefully, or if a lighting design does not work our principles with our principles, we are putting our sensitive species at risk. We are also uh, compromising the pristine sky. And of course, we're compromising the expectations that our future guests in our stargazing hotels will have. 
So all of this has really changed my mind from going from the brightest tower in the block to actually thinking like, do I need this ball art? Do I need this downlight here? Um, what will it bring to the project? So as part of, of the, the whole initiative, I've been interacting with different disciplines and of that I've never thought, thought that I would inter interact before. So something that really touched me was when, uh, I think it was a year ago, a little bit over a year ago, I had the chance to participate in a turtle hatching survey with our environmental team and with a team of international scientists. We went to one of our islands called Bream Island and we walked for hours. We went in a boat and then we walked for hours in this island and we were, um, we were looking for these little hatchings and actually it was worth it was worth all the pain of walking in the in in the middle of nowhere and we found 60 of these little hatchlings and we experimented with them we put them in a circle and uh, we saw the reaction to light we saw that actually instead of them walking back to see where they should be uh, walking to they walk towards the sky glow and that's when it really started making sense for me how can i protect these turtles how can perhaps i work with the landscape team to create some sort of uh dunes of, or some sort of block so they're not confused by the glow of the city or by the glow of our assets and they're actually safe and swim back to the sea where they actually have a better chance of survival Another very also very special experience was the baseline measurement survey that we did, uh, where we traveled through all our assets. We went to the mountains, to the volcanoes, uh, to the islands, uh, to every single corner, and we measured the darkness with an SQM. And this was, again, something that I never learned of in design school, never would have imagined. And uh, what that helped me understand is uh, the value of having a pristine sky. So for example, the further from the cities that we went, the clearer I could see the, the Milky Way. And actually, uh, at this stage of my life, this was the very first time that I saw the Milky Way. And um, I said, I think we all were stunned. Many of us were not from the environmental team, but we were stunned up about the beauty and we were already questioning what can we do to actually preserve it. So as I mentioned, as an architect and as a lighting designer, you're never taught about environment in, in this depth at school. You're never taught about uh, what is an SQM meter, what, how can you protect the sky from darkness? So I really think that, for example, um, we need to speak to the universities. We need to speak to the to the lighting design schools. I think it's now growing, right? But if you don't learn this when you're studying lighting design, it might take you more to understand the care that you should that you should have when selecting lights. So uh, the idea would be to create more respectful designs. The second lesson that I've learned after all of these environmental lessons that I've told you is the courage for setting new standards. So, and how to challenge the conventional design criteria. So after I found myself in a complete new different environment, I saw that uh, the, what I have been learning from years in school and what I had been practicing didn't always apply if you actually wanted to, wanted to um, design towards a dark sky friendly environment. Uh, if, we, if we give a step back, for example, the conventions that engineers, that lighting designers follow are sometimes not uh, related to the new, new advances in technology, to the output that the that fixtures have, to the distribution that fixtures have. And if you apply these standards blindly, like sometimes you are required to do sometimes in your contract it says that you need to that you need to comply with these standards you can easily be over designing or over lighting a, a place so that's also something that at the red sea we are doing we're challenging these standards and it's not easy we can do it because we are designing for ourselves we have the luck to 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 own these these areas but i think that it will be very challenging for people that are perhaps designing more urban environments where actually the municipalities require these standards. So again, uh, my, heroes, my heroes come in who are the lighting designers that, um, that we are actually testing. We're telling them, okay, we need to make sure that this area is lit enough. We are okay with deviating with the standards, but we also need to assure that our guests will be safe. So um, in order to do this, we, we have created, we are now testing. So for lighting designers, if you speak to a lighting designer, as I'm putting here in the, in the screen, 
uh, only with testing different light sources, only by making what we call mock-ups of different scenarios or of, okay, how can you light up a, um, a pathway if it's not with high output pole lights? What would happen if you just uh, bring it down, bring the sources down, make them warm and just use very, very selected, um, select, very well selected um, uh, luminaires. So uh, this has all come, this has all created a, a need for innovation, a need for um, for thinking outside of the box. And again, also stepping back and say, okay, we, we might not need too many features, but only carefully selected ones that will make this building even more special rather than lighting every single corner, every single column. What if we choose on the most important aspects? Um, and yeah. now, yeah, okay. Thank you. And now one of the biggest challenges is also how to how to convince people about um, about darkness and about how uh, to be less afraid of darkness. So I was listening to Betty, Maya, Betty Maya's uh, um, TED talk and actually uh, dark skies mean dark means dark skies and not dark ground so people need to need to understand that we can light the ground as we have here in one of our beautiful renders of TPA who's our lighting who's one of our lighting designers we can aim the light downwards we don't really need to uplight many walls or anything if you carefully select the the light sources uh, you can create a, a very safe environment for the for the visitors for the for the for the for the people that work in these areas, and finally to close up uh, this this talk, I wanted to share with you a thought that I heard about creativity recently, uh, and it said that um, creativity is a process of having original ideas that have value, and it mainly comes from different ways of seeing things and by interacting with other disciplines. So. Uh, only, let's say, as a designer, when I started talking with people from environment, when I started talking with 3D developers, with sorry, software developers that are helping us develop this light pollution model that we're now testing, uh, and with our community marketing team that have helped us realize what the importance of uh, creating a um, awareness throughout because even though we have these beautiful renders we can have these very very thorough 3d models and studies if we don't raise this awareness and we don't communicate it to the public uh, we cannot really reach to our goals and we cannot really build these these uh, destinations that we would like to so i understand that the relation between uh, designers and dark sky might not be so obvious but i i hope that with with these lessons that i've shared so far uh, i i could perhaps put the community together to allow that all of the all of you astronomers environmentalists start also talking with the designers who unfortunately sometimes are the might be the cause of light pollution so that's it for me thank you very much Thank you, Patricia. Again, a wonderful job. I can understand uh, working for um, Middle East is uh, uh, a bit challenging. The env environment is different. The people background is different. I can at the same time you uh, caught the audience attention. Um, Nora Roll, I think I'm saying his name right. He said the title just glued me to my seat. <laughs> And uh, Tamir says that you did a great job. Uh, thank you. Hi, Patricia. You, you really did a great job in Neom. Uh, that's really wonderful yeah. to hear. Uh, again, uh, write uh, your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, for uh, Patricia. We'll take Q, uh, uh, the, your questions later at the end of the session. Uh, now we will go to our third uh, speaker. Uh, Valérie, Valérie, right? Valérie, Valérie yes. <laughs> Valérie, Valérie, yes. Valérie uh, Shrimplet. Okay, so uh, she's a senior research uh, associate at Grisham College uh, in London, having studied at the uh, lots of our University of Bristol, uh, Bristol, Manchester, and I'm not sure if I'm gonna pronounce this name um, correctly. Whitwatersand. <laughs> It says Johannesburg. 
Uh, she has lectured at the published widely of the influence on astronomy and cosmology on art and architecture, particularly for Byzantine, medieval, and the Renaissance periods. Uh, hello, uh, welcome with us, hello. and the floor is yours. Okay, right. Well, I'll just share my screen. I hope this is going to work. And do the slideshow from the beginning. Okay, well, I think I think that's um that's okay now. Um so firstly I'd like to thank uh, thank everybody for the invitation to attend this really important conference and um to say good morning, afternoon, or evening to to all of you. I'm speaking to you from St Albans, which is about 25 miles north of London, where the stargazing is, as you can imagine, not, not terribly good. Um, but now I'm, I'm going to speak about something rather different from the previous talks we've had on biology, botany, education and design. I'm a historian and I'm interested in looking at the history of things and an art historical approach in particular to the problems that we're facing now. So just to begin with, um, I'd like to, to draw your attention to a quotation by Rolf Waldo Emerson in 1836, who observed that if the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, how would men believe and adore? But every night come out the, the stars of beauty and light the universe with their admonishing smile. So in fact, um, it's, it's something that we're not used to anymore, but how amazing it would be if, if um, it, it only happened rarely. And of course it is becoming more rare. So as an overview, uh, just a minute, I'm trying to, I've got images covering over some of my text, but anyway, so I, I, my, my approach is that visual images of the sky or heavens are an essential backstory to the protection of the dark sky. The contemplation of stars and planets and the heavens have, have inspired myths, religions, philosophies and legends from the ancient Greeks and medieval Europe through to the, the Renaissance, the industrial age in our own time. And I'm going to be looking at the Milky Way as a, as a case study and looking at grasping the complexities of the universe and, and how this led to scientific theories. And yet science, it seems, with all this lighting and light pollution is actually re removing astronomical phenomena from common sight. So focusing on our galaxy, the Milky Way, um, some recent evidence shows that the Milky Way is no longer visible to a third of humanity, including 60% of Europeans and roughly 80% of Americans. And in fact, during a 1994 blackout, Los Angeles red residents called the 911 emergency number when they saw the Milky Way for the first time, a minor earth tremor had actually caused a blackout and they saw the Milky Way and, and it, it actually invoked fear and wonder and amazement. So the world population and light pollution um, is something that's, that's growing all the time. I've been looking at world population in relation to light pollution and I think there's a roughly a, a correlation between population increase and light pollution. But of course, light pollution um, matrices were only considered and, and formulated a few years ago. So I'm going to use population as a rough index, a rough correlation with light pollution. So on the left from the this data um, program, you can see that um, the population has increased phenomenally in the last um, few decades and is now approaching about 8 billion. The most um, affected, an example here of the most affected area is, this is actually Monaco, which is the most densely populated area 
on the planet. It's less than one square mile, the most densely populated um, principality, because it is actually a, a nation in itself. It's less than one square mile and has a population of about 37,000 people. But if we look back um, at the familiar, familiarity with the night sky, of course, has always been, been with us from when mankind start looking up at the sky and, and contemplating the universe. So some beautiful examples here, the sky goddess, the, an Egyptian example, the sky goddess Newt, depicted as the Milky Way, or on the right hand side at the top here, you can see the sun, moon and stars um, on a boundary stone from Babylonia, which is 12th century BC. In ancient Greece, um, Plato observed in Timaeus, which is his, his work, which is, was the best, best known until the Renaissance and also involved with cosmology in the universe. And Plato writes that none of the accounts concerning the universe would have been given if, if men had not seen the stars or sun or heaven. I presume he meant women as well there, but, but the word is actually men. The vision of day and night and the months and years actually caused number, it caused clocks, it caused calendars and the notion of time and, and a means of researching into the nature of the universe. And you can tell by these images from um, ancient Greek vase painting, um, here where we have the, a row of stars along the top of the vase in the example on the left, or at the example on the right, the word at the top, Asteria, um, stars, she is the goddess of falling stars and night from the fifth century BC. So you can see how important the visions of the stars were. Now, as I mentioned, I'm correlating this to population. And here we can see, and I've used population education, the reference is given below here on Vimeo. And we can see an, an image of the population of, of the world from about the second century um, AD, Christian era. And here you can see the population around Europe in China and Japan and India and also in the Americas. But of course, these ancient settlements in Greece and Rome and the rush lights and torches and oil lamps would have had very little impact on the vision of the dark sky. The fact that it was familiar to everyone is, is demonstrated, for example, by this silver coin from the reign of the emperor, the Roman emperor Hadrian in the second century. And you can see here, that we have the seven sisters, the Pleiades, depicted on the coin because it would have been familiar to every, everybody in a way that this perhaps is no longer. Moving on, by about the 10th century um, and in the Norse medieval um, traditions, we can see how the um, images of the stars were related to the idea of the creation of the universe and how in this mythology, um, the body parts of a, of a slaughtered God were thrown into the sky to make the sun, moon, stars and planets, which compares in a way with the um, Judeo-Christian uh, account of the creation. So in the Judeo, Christian account, where we have a lot of examples in, um, in Europe. Um, we have in from the book of Genesis, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, meaning the sun and the lesser light to rule the night, moon, and he made the stars also. And of course, there's a huge amount of symbolism, not only in Christianity, but in other religions, linking the sun and stars and moon to gods, goddesses, and so on. Uh, the examples here from uh, the mausoleum of Galla Placidia in Ravenna, 5th century, and also Santa Polinari in Class A nearby um, from a later date. But you can see here the stars are very stylized and symmetrical, and there's no attempt really to um, depict the heavens as they appeared. And so in the tradition, the Judeo-Christian art and architecture also um, carries on. And on the right, we've got an example of a manuscript from Hildegard of Bingen showing the six days of creation, which is covered with a, a starry sky in the background. And this, of course, was a manuscript which would probably have only been available to educated monks and nuns and the intelligentsia. 
Whereas on the left, we've got a, a mosaic from the cathedral in Monreal in Sicily of God creating the universe um, from the 12th century. And of course, these images would have been open to a very, very large congregation and are being used in a way as um, the, the book of the illiterate to, to show masses of people, the common people, as well as the educated ones, um, the idea of the creation and how important stars and the sky and the dark sky in particular were in that. So looking then back to, we can see from this population map how the population increases. And I think a correlation with the, um, with the, the light, the increasing light pollution is a valid one here, of course, but it's still very minimal by the 12th century. In St. Mark's in Venice, for example, we've got the Ascension Dome. And here we have in mosaic Christ um, seated on, an, this is called an arc en ciel, the curved image in which he's sitting. Um, or it could actually be a, an attempt at showing the Milky Way. But again, showing um, the deity in, in the universe and the importance of the stars and, and spirituality in all forms of religion. It, it comes through in, in Muslim and Hindu and other religions. Uh, it's not, not exclusive to the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. But by the, um, by the later Middle Ages, the science seems to have been increasing. And here in these two manuscripts, the Milky Way is actually depicted as a circle of stars, which is a very modern concept where you do actually have the galaxy as a, as a closed circle. And in the 12th century, um, these examples of, um, of um, the images in, depicted in manuscripts as, uh, of the Milky Way shows the Milky Way here yeah, as a circle. And this one, I think this is just absolutely, uh, absolutely beautiful. This is from De Rerum Natura, which is a, a manuscript in, in Vienna, showing the, the monk's impression and inspiration of the stars in the Milky Way. This later example from the 14th century is particularly interesting. Again, the stars are still stylized, but they're not quite as symmetrical. There's more of a, an attempt to, um, to demonstrate that they were, they are arranged not in symmetrical patterns. And the interesting thing here, I think, is the angels shown in an image uh, detail on the left. The angels are actually turning the sphere of the stars as it then was. Um, cranking these handles um, to rotate the series of the sphere of stars around the, the Earth, which, however, is still de depicted as a flat Earth in, in the middle, in the form of what is known as a, a T and O map with Jerusalem at the center. Later on, we have more um, specific images of the Milky Way from this dream of, of Scipio. And the idea of that the Milky Way in the Milky Circle is the place where ancestors or spirits might end up. And then we come to um, the, the early Renaissance where we've got Giotto's um, image of the ceiling in the Urena Chapel in Padua. And starry ceilings are, were very, very common in um, in the Renaissance, Giotto being sort of proto or very early Renaissance. But you can see here from the detail on the right that the stars are completely stylized and done in, in regular lines in a very symmetrical pattern. So without any attempt to depict the sky sort of as is. Um, Chaucer, the English poet and, and writer in, in the 14th century, actually refers to the galaxy. And the, gal the word galaxy, of course, is, is derived from the Greek word gala, gala, which means milk, and that's where the name Milky Way comes from. And he also talks about, look low the galaxy, which men call the Milky Way, for it is white. And so Chaucer in the 14th century would perceive, would be familiar with this white thing in the sky. Even the Sistine Chapel had a starry sky to start with, which we know from the image on the right, um, which um, before 
Michelangelo had it had a go at it and repainted the chapel, of course. But Michelangelo's um, image of of the chapel, his images are very cosmic indeed. <clears throat> but the idea also comes through in literature. In Dante, the Divine Comedy in Paradiso, he talks about how he saw lovely things that the heavens hold and would come out once more to see the stars. And this is on the left, we have a drawing by Botticelli of an illustration to Dante's Divine Co um, Comedy, which shows all the stars and the image of Christ as the sun in the center. In Shakespeare, Romeo, in Romeo and Juliet, it's evident. And Juliet actually asked that, that Shakespeare, that um, Romeo would be turned into stars so that all the world would be in love with night. And Shakespeare also um, refers to astrology, but, but sort of shooting it down because he says the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. In other words, it's, it's the idea of free will rather than fate. And this is also reflected in the Patsy Chapel in Florence in the mid 15th century, where we have here a, a dome. That's a view from beneath of a dome where you can see that the stars are really accurately portrayed and you can pick out, <clears throat> for example, the bear, what, what um, in England is known as the plough, um, also known as the bear or the big dipper, and which in fact, uh, being so near London um, is hardly visible at, at, at night. But an image that I, uh, an idea that I found very interesting um, and quite recently too, was Shakespeare's King Lear. Now, I recently had the good fortune to go and see Sh King Shakespeare's King Lear performed at the Globe in, in London. And I was struck by how much astronomy and references to the, the dark skies there are in it. He talks about the eclipses of the sun and moon in act one. He, he mentions that the stars above govern us in Act Four. And then he also talks about smiting flat the thick rotundity of the world in Act Three, um, which shows that you know, the, the spherical Earth um, was, was accepted by then as opposed to the flat Earth, which um, is a, a subject of a whole, whole other discussion. But what it was particularly struck me in seeing Shakespeare's King Lear recently was that Shakespeare, as most of you probably know, um, quite often has a bit of light relief in some of his, his works and he cracks jokes and he cracks a couple of jokes in, in the tragedy of King Lear. And one of the jokes, um, which follows on actually from a very silly joke about a snail carrying its house on its back. He poses, Shakespeare poses a riddle, the riddle and the riddle is, what is the reason why the seven stars are no more than seven? And the answer is because they're not eight. And he said, yes. Now, this is incredibly significant because it means that it's obviously a reference to the Pleiades, which is made of seven, seven stars that are visibly, visible easily. And Shakespeare would have known that his audience, some of whom were very educated and intelligentsia, but many were just common people, um, the person in the street, the ordinary people. And he knew that everybody would have been familiar with the Pleiades. Now the audience in London last summer um, probably didn't get the joke, whereas Shakespeare knew that his audience would get this jokey reference to the Pleiades constellation. Moving swiftly on, by the 16th century, we have um, images by Tintoretto, The Birth of the Milky Way, where the stars are still quite stylized. But by the time of Rubens, um, you can see that the starry background above this image is very much related to actual um, observation. And by then, of course, um, with the age of, of Galileo, following on from Copernicus, we have the use of telescopes and so on. And this is all respect, reflected in art. So let's get back to the science now, just um, drawing to a close, that the population growth and lightning, lighting, if we look in 1417, there were the first organized lighting of the streets. It was actually a may mayoral decree to light the bit to, for the streets of London to be lit in the early 15th century. And then not a great deal happened, but by the 1800s, there was more efficient coal-fueled lighting, London's first gas-lit road, 
in Baltimore, they were way ahead in lighting streets. Um, the first electric lights um, were in Paris in 1878, following on from street lighting as early as 1820. And then of course, Thomas Edison invented the incandescent lamps leading to light bulbs for street lighting. And you can see it on the, on the right hand side, how the, the population and exploration just gradually increased at this time. But still, oops, still in the, um, in 1804, um, Wordsworth, I'm sure a lot of you know his poem about the daffodils, but it's not so well known perhaps that he describes the daffodils in the English Lake District as continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. So the Lake District now in England is still a good, a relatively good place to view, observe the stars. But shortly afterwards, Byron, um, Lord Byron um, wrote a poem about she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry stars. And that was written in central London in 1814. But as the industrial revolution increases, we can see how the population increases and also the light pollution. By the 19th century, Van Gogh's work reflects the stars. And this is why it's so important that we do protect the night skies. Van Gogh shows here in, in two examples, the starry sky, which was done and the idea that these spiral shapes should reflect spiral galaxies, which were being talked about at the time, or his image of the, the plow or the Great Bear Big Dipper and his image on the right. The Pre-Raphaelites here again in the late 19th century, we've got real constellations being depicted on the left here. And um, you can see how night with her train of stars, the idea of stars is something that was very caused a lot of interest as scientific advances happened in the, in the late 19th century. And now bringing up to the modern time, and of course here we've got um, huge population increases in, in India and China, for example, and these don't necessarily any more um, correspond with, with light pollution because um, some of these are very poor areas where there would not be so much light, but it's still, I think, valid as, a, as an indication until we get to the more recent years when actual mapping of actual light pollution, as shown by other, other speakers, is, is um, actually scientifically being done. And here is one of those. This is a, an actual light pollution um, image of, of Europe and I'm, I'm actually sitting there under the great blob where, where London is. But still, we still have the inspiration of these astronomical phenomena, the, the love of the dark sky, such as Nelson's Milky Way. Um, this is written in relation to legends of a central Australian tribe, the Wolpiri, in, the, in central Australia where views are still um, excellent, of course. Or this um, wall hanging of, of the Milky Way, which is actually um, made of, of buttons sewn onto a tapestry. So in our modern age, um, you know, moving briefly on, this shows that really something has to be done about this. And the backstory to of this art history and the way that it's inspired artists. Our last speaker spoke about creativity inspired by the night sky. And now, of course, we have astrophotography and the image on the left is from the Webb telescope. And so just to finish off with, we've got these two fantastic images of Earthrise from the um, Apollo mission or the, pale, the famous pale blue dot. Um, which was taken of Earth, that is, that little dot is, is um, where we are, um, in the midst of this immense universe. And this is why it is so important, I think, to, to be able to um, protect the dark skies and, and the inspiration and images that it, that it brings to all of us. I was recently in, in Maine, in the States, in a very small fishing village, and I just love this, um, this note that was pinned on the door of the fisherman's hut. We are all in this together. 
um, we have to understand, we have to think about this together and do what we can to, um, to preserve the dark skies from light pollution. I haven't spoken about all the biology and the architectural lighting. I've really presented this as a, as a sort of a backstory to what we need to, to, do, to do now in this really important uh, issue. So thank you. I think I'm to time and any questions? Or I think the questions come at the end of the session. Uh, yeah, thank you, Valerie, for the very interesting um, topic and presentation. Um, all of us were like just looking in <laughs> and uh, amazed by uh, your presentation. Many uh, good comments I can see in the chat. Everyone's thanking you. Uh, remember to write your uh, question for Valerie in the uh, Q and A. We will take questions uh, one by one. First, we'll go to the, our first speaker. Uh, Piraj? Oh, yes. Hi, how are you? <laughs> You're Hi. here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, first question from um, Diane. Have you ever tried to do a light survey of an area with kids looking at the, at the light in an area? Thanks for the wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation. That's the first question. Uh, so far, we've never done a light survey. Um, the closest thing we've done is the we look at the map from that, uh, NASA of like the lighting pollution, light pollution distribution throughout the world, and we kind of zoom into our spot. But we have not done like a light survey of a specific area yet with kids. Okay. Second question from Lucas: How big is your hope? These kids will join the dark sky movement in 20 years or later. Oh, that's a whole inspiration for everything. Um, being able to make kids in the future like be interested in the subject and hopefully become future dark sky workers is what truly draws me to like even start the idea and the project. So I'm hoping that like a good portion of them go on to join the dark sky movement in the future. And hopefully they make great impactful changes as well. Uh, thank you. You have another question from Howard. Uh, says you showed that children were engaged with the model, seen with light and figures that they can play with. Do you think that this may work with older people? And great work, by the way. Uh, thank you. And I think the models were specifically designed for little kids, but I think with older people, it may work as well because curiosity is not just something that's limited to little kids. It lies in all of us from all ages. So we can work with older people the same way we can work with younger people. And I think it could work uh, pretty well with older people as well. Because I've also heard of like, uh, I like at my work here in nature centers and stuff, we've also had older people come by and when they look at it, they're still amazed. So yeah, I think it's something that can work with people of all ages because curiosity lies in all of us. Thank you, Viraj, once again, for being here with us. Um, I believe there are other comments for you in the chat. Maybe you would like to address them. Um, now I'll go to uh, Patricia. You have a question from, I'm not sure if I'm, I can't say his name correctly. We what? Not, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, he says uh, in um, Thailand is, uh, sorry, an angle I see in Thailand is that the ability to see the Milky Way and many stars is becoming a privileged luxury for city dwellers and could be an angle to get policymaker to get bored with the dark sky move movement. Do you agree and disagree? And he says also there is a resort in Thailand that has been active in protecting sea turtles. Great. Thank you so much for the comment. And definitely, I'm going to check out that that resort in Thailand. It's such a beautiful country. And yeah, I, I do agree, you know, um, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, this, I would say, maybe being on lockdown for some time, the fact that we are now mostly living in cities, we are. And I can I can see from my friends that actually looking at, having a look, good look at a Milky Way can seem as some sort of luxury. And I do think that we need to 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 draw the advantages from it. And if we're developing hotels, let's say in such settings that have pristine skies, it would be a good opportunity to use this as 
as, as a plus to say, okay, you'll enjoy these beautiful destinations and you'll get to see the best look of the dark sky as you can. So definitely, I agree. Uh, thank you. There is a question from Alejandro. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, are you planning to publish the research? Um, I think, well, we are, our marketing team is very active in uh, publishing as much as we can. Some of the information might be confidential just because we're waiting until the hotel is open. So they're, they're open for everybody. But if you, if you, if you join uh, the Red Sea Global, there's a page where we publish different blogs and different articles on dark sky. So definitely, if not a, a research, there are a few articles and maybe at the end we will publish a research, yes. It would be great. Uh, there is another question also from Lucas. Uh, Lucas says, are other lighting designers, lighting designers team convinced by your concept or only if your concept, if your concept with some design price fit? Okay, I'm not really sure if I understand the question, but okay, so as the Red Sea, which is a big corporation, we uh, appoint different lighting consultants and we ask them to follow the dark sky principles. So um, let's say if a lighting designer is willing to follow it, then they will. And uh, it's not our motivation is not getting a, a recognition or, or a prize. It's more about doing the right thing. So if we're going to these pristine places in, in Saudi Arabia and building our own nature, it goes in line with our values that we follow this principle. So I think the biggest reward that we'll have is to, is to keep the hatchlings, keep the turtles untouched as much as we can. That is our main reward, doing the right thing. Okay, there is, I believe, um, other comments in the chat. Maybe we would like to address yeah. them. Uh, I'll finish well. the questions here and then we'll go there to the chat. Um, oh, Norman, there is a, a question from, um, hold on, let me read. Uh, Norman, yes, he says, what's the best way to suit clients from choosing brighter outdoors lighting? I think of what we've learned is all about education. I think that the, there are many IDA, uh, IDA uh, videos and posts about uh, the, how people are afraid of dark. So I think it's mostly about education. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, to have like the brightest space if you don't use the right light you will not feel safe. So I would say raising awareness, doing campaigns, educating people on how they, they can use the light in the best way. I think that's the key. Um, I'll take one more from Diane. Uh, she says areas in Europe uh, like Albania that have wonderful dark skies are getting massive building upgrades to the ports by Mumbai architects. How can we inspire them to consider dark sky in their planning stage stages? So that's a very good question. That's something that we're actually dealing with. I, again, I think it's about showing them examples. For me, what's worked is showing them examples of maybe some resorts, like we mentioned in Thailand and uh, in other places of Europe, where you can actually have very beautiful cities, very safe cities, very successful resorts that actually respect, respect dark sky. I think it takes a lot of work. And uh, there's th thank you, the IDA, for supporting myself and many others like me with such a, a good material so to enable us to go to municipalities and bring up the subject which we are constantly doing so I think that's it is raising awareness educating people and support getting support from the IDA and working with the IDA for these causes yeah uh, thank you Patricia again you can address the questions in the chat uh, now Very we nice. have a question to uh, Valerie uh, where did it go let me see which one uh, from Nuru, uh, where can we read your research papers related to art, history, and astronomy? Oh, hello! Thank you for asking that. Uh, yeah, I've got I've got a small website that I set up, which has got some of my papers on it and talks. Um, I did my this sort of grew out of my PhD, which was on a link between Copernican heliocentricity and Michelangelo's Last Judgment. 
And from that, I got involved with art and astronomy. And um, so if you have a look, I'll put it in the box that I do have a, a website which has got links to some other papers, um, also Academia Edu and, and some online talks that I've given. But I've, I'd also like to draw attention to a series of conferences called the Conferences on the Inspiration of Astronomical Phenomena, known as INSAP for short. And I'll, I'll put a link to that in the box as well. And this is where um, a lot of sort of astronomers, architects, literary experts and historians, art historians come together. There was actually a conference on this in, in uh, Caltech in California that I attended last September. And on that site and with naming the people and the program and the talks um, from the September conference are actually available online. Um, and, and we're planning another conference in the series. But things like, I can see that um, other people have commented in the Q&A box on ancient sites around the world. And that this is a whole new area of um, archaeoastronomy and astronomical alignments of sites um, to different stars and constellations or um, phenomena like the, you know, the solstice or the equinox. Um, so thank you for asking that. And I'll send the links, I'll hit send now, um, if anybody's interested to, to see more. Uh, thank you, Valerie. There is another uh, question from Holly. Have the stars dropped out of contemporary art today? Hello, Holly. <laughs> Thanks for joining in. Yes, I, I think that compared with the, the manuscripts and the examples that I'm, I've shown, it's not that stars are sort of absent from contemporary art, but I do think they're more unusual because I think that um, it's sort of nowadays, it seems to me less more to, left more to astrophotography. And some of these are enhanced and things like Hubble and Webb, some of them are enhanced and it's difficult to know what are actual images and some of them have been artistically enhanced. Um, so yes, perhaps um, people are sort of not, not doing it so much because they're, they're, um, they're not so familiar, they're not so rare. But then I've, I've noticed actually that fashions, you get fashions with stars all over them and perhaps it's like the dinosaurs, they're popular because we see less of them or, or they're beginning to cease to exist. Thank you for answering that. There's another question from Anne. She says, how can she use uh, art history in advocacy work? Yeah, I, I presume you mean advocacy in advocating the dark skies. Um, so, you know, you're, the, the images that I use are all pretty much available online. Um, a good source and the ones I took most of them from are from Wikimedia Commons, um, which are public domain images. And I think the idea of, of using this as a backstory to, to tell people and especially children and young people. I, I did enjoy Viraj's um, presentation on, on catching people young early. Um, it's very important to show them this because so many of the kids, I mean, including my own kids and grandkids, they, they live in central London. They're not familiar with stars, except if they have the fortune to, to go on holiday to somewhere where stars are, are more easily visible. So I think these images, if you think of how people were inspired, how common it was, the Shakespeare con quotation, shows how people were so familiar with the stars before that Shakespeare could crack jokes about constellations, which would really not happen nowadays. So yeah, um, ha have a Google, have a, have a look on Wikimedia Commons or have a look at some of my, my work. I'd be glad for people to, to mention it. Uh, we have a question from Douglas. I believe he wants to know your opinion on uh, light pollution in general. What do you think about street lights and uh, light pollution? Is that one for me? Or, or the panel in general? Uh, in general, yes. C can, I, can I say something that's occurred to me the other talks I've been watching, which is that 
we're talking about fear of the dark um, for street lighting and light pollution. And I don't think it's so much fear of the dark, but fear about what's in it. Mm-hmm. So in the past, and the examples I gave, fear of what's in it might be um, forests, it might be wild animals, it might be robbers, it might be ghosts and spirits and, and the dead and so on. I think nowadays the lighting um, and architectural, um, as Patricia spoke about, um, it's fear of fear of what might be in the dark, might be crime, might be criminals. Maybe it'd be a good idea to solve crime and then we wouldn't need so much lighting. But of course, it's also about stopping people falling down steps, which I did recently, and they put a light in the next day I was there and there was a light. Um, but I think the other reason why lighting is used so much in architecture and design is the ambiance. Now, I live in St Albans in Hertfordshire in England, just north of London, and the cathedral is floodlit at night. And a lot of these buildings are floodlit. And it's it's really beautiful and it's about ambiance. But, for example, in London, they talk about floodlighting the buildings. But if they switched all the floodlighting off, they could see the Milky Way. Um, again, there is a, a question, I believe, for everyone. Maybe we can all of you answer it one by one. As the Christmas time is getting closer and light are part of the magical atmosphere, do you have any advice on how to keep the magical light with minimal pollution? I have some experience uh, with that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have some experience okay. with that. For example, when I was working in Dubai, um, yeah, we wanted to once it was okay to celebrate Christmas, uh, yes, there was a lot of demand for lighting all the trees with Christmas lights, putting ornaments and everything. And there was not much to do because actually that's what the tourists want. And at the end, there are developments that are driven by tourism. But I think that um, what we need to do is tackle it from a more pragmatic way and an open way. It is very hard to go to a developer and say, you must switch all the Christmas lights off. Um, but uh, we can time them, we can use controls, we can make them warmer. And actually a very bright and glaring source is not is not appealing for anybody. Maybe it will attract you for a, for a few days, but not, not a lot. So I think it's about more uh, working with controls, making sure that uh, the municipality has their needs met, the commercial teams have their needs met, but also we take care of dark sky. So I would say dialogues, controls, education, that's the key. Yeah, could, could I come in there? I, I think the Christmas lighting, it seems to me it's about two things. Light is incredibly important as a symbol in religions, not just Christianity, but the Hindu festival of Diwali, I hope I got that right. And I think also light, um, for example, in the Greek Orthodox Church, light at Easter, where the light spreads, everybody carries candles, is really important. And we want to keep that light symbolism connected to these religious festivals. But I think a lot of the light nowadays is commercial and it, it's about selling and, and promoting things. And, and with the, the sort of the, the globe going into recession now, um, maybe that's necessary, but as, as Patricia says, I, I hope it can be um, limited um, in, in a way. Uh, going off of the previous two responses, um, I'm not too familiar with working with Christmas lights, but I think um, as previously stated, if we work on like minimizing the amount of time they're up and working on making them more effective and like limited in some areas, not overdoing it, I think it can be a cool tradition to keep on doing while also minimizing the negative impacts of the light pollution from it. Thank you, Viraj. Uh, there is a question for from Diane for to Valerie. Do you do talks like this at Art Gallery? Um, it would be it would be a way to reach different audience. Yes, yes, I I have given um, I did give a, a talk on this subject at a previous. Um, at a previous conference, um, it was pre-lockdown actually, and I have a, a poster which was at this conference, the INSAP conference in September, so that will be online, but actually I'm giving a public talk at St Albans Cathedral on the 1st of December on this, and, and it will be 
longer and more relaxed, not not crammed into 20 minutes. Um, and that, if, if you do a search for St Albans Cathedral, you'll see um, that I'll, I will give this talk or a version of this talk again and linking it more with the theology for the cathedral audience. So um, you can probably find that by doing a search. But otherwise, um, yeah, I'd refer you to my to my website for um, talks or if you do a search for me on YouTube, there are a few things that might come up. everyone i um by the way there are some comments in the chat if you would like to address them uh i don't know if there are any other questions maybe you can write them in the uh, q a before we wrap up our lovely uh session and um, i would like to remind you for the engagement workshops after this uh, session uh, please uh, tune in and thank you again for everyone. I'm not sure if we have uh, uh, another minute or uh, one and two. Um, maybe Peter Maria can tell us. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up since we got to hop over to the engagement workshop and the attendee package is in the chat with all the links to join. Once again, thank you all. Um, it was a pleasure to be here with you all. And um, uh, again, um, please tune in for the uh, workshops, engage workshops, and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much. It was a great session. Really enjoyed thank participating. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.